John 15, verse 9 through 10. And the word of the Lord declares, as the Father have loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Verse 10 says, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I want to share with you from a subject entitled, Abiding in the Father's Love. Abiding in the Father's Love. An author by the name of Henry Miller said, the only thing we never get enough of is love. And the only thing we never give enough of is love. You know, there was a song by uh, the uh, author or a a, a psalmist or a songwriter, singer, I'll get it right, by the name of Jackie DeShannon. And she sang what the world needs now is love, sweet love. She said, that's the only thing there's just too little of, meaning that there needs to be love and more love in the world. And we don't have enough love, don't give enough love, cannot be too much love. We need love. The Beatles says, all you need is love. It may not be all you need but it is certainly where it all begins. We need to start with love, and we need to end with love. In fact, our Christian responsibility in the world is to manifest the love of God. And I really say the love of God because not this human love, because human love, it is narrow and it is shallow. But the love of God is agape. It is a deep thing. And the deepest thing we can do is not prophesy or preach or exercise our spiritual gift. The deepest thing that we could ever do is love somebody. Ask your neighbor, how deep is your love? That's the deepest thing that you could do is love somebody. And love has character. The Bible said it is patient and it's kind. It's not boastful. You know, it doesn't hold any records of wrong. Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love, you know, it is the greatest. It is the heavyweight champion of the whole world. Somebody say, love somebody. And so, you know, every year, I don't care how many times we hear it, I make sure, you know, as the Lord leads me and when he tells me to do it, but I make sure that we talk about love. We talk about so many other things, but the scripture says that God is love. Like out of all the other words that could describe God, there's no word that describes God more than love. Love, God's love, it is perfect. It's not like our love. It lacks nothing. It has no flaws. He's perfect and his love is perfect. It can't be improved upon. God can't love you any more or any less than what he loved you because if he did, it would cease to be perfect. So God's love is what we need in our hearts. And so we have a certain love. You know, if you love me, I love you. But God's love, it looks past faults and it sees needs. It goes beyond the surface. It it is a love that's everlasting. A love that's never ending, a love that's unchanging, a love that's infallible. You can't beat God's love. In fact, God says that I love you. He says if you, you know, what the scripture says, what can separate us from the love of God? Height, nor death, nor angels, nor principality, nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. His love It's so wide, you can't go around it. It's so high, you can't go over it. Amen. His love is so deep, you can't go under it. So God's love is what we need. I remember the first message I ever preached was the love of God. 
My pastor told me at the time, Pastor Robert Edler, he said, the only thing you could have did to that message to make it better is put a better title on it. He said, you can ask what love got to do with it. And the truth about the matter is love has everything to do with it. If you are a Christian and you have not majored in love, you have not majored in the first things. That's what it's all about. If you're not loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself, you haven't began to walk like a Christian. You haven't began to manifest the true essence of the kingdom of God. Am I talking right in here? And so we need to abide in the Father's love. Now, the truth about the matter is that each of us have experienced God's love if we are saved. Would you all agree? To some degree, we all know the love of God. But in order to abide in God's love, you must understand that he is, he is our father. He is our father. And that's critical. And a lot of people don't understand that because when you understand that he's our father, you understand that it's relational. And that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to reveal God, not just as this God of war, this God of judgment, but he came. One of his assignments was to reveal God as our loving, caring, sharing heavenly father. In fact, when he told the disciples to pray, he said, when you pray, he, don't, he didn't say, say God. He said, say our father. And they had never heard that concept. That, that concept was foreign to them because they saw God as a God of war and a God of judgment and a God. And they knew the names of God. They saw his goodness as well. Jehovah Nisi and Jehovah Rapha and Jehovah Mekadesh and Jehovah El Olam and Jehovah Rafiga. They knew all of these names. God is a healer, provider, all of these things. But they never heard anyone refer to him as father. And so when we get a revelation of the Father's love, then it brings us into an understanding of how much we are loved. And when we understand how much we are loved, there is a tendency for us to want to reciprocate. I saw that, um, that, that, that clip that you all had up there yesterday about the Incredibles, and it was when she saw how much he loved her and care for her, it provoked a response from her. And that's what God wants. He wants us to know how much he loves us. A lot of us trying to improve our love, and we're trying to love God better, but a better place to start is to understand how much he loves you. And when you understand how much he loves you, it just provokes a response into, from you that you just want to love him better. You just want to do better. And he says, if you love me, it'll be manifested when you keep my commandments. So it'll cause you to live better, to do better when you realize the love of God, how much he loves you. He's Abba Father. He's just not Father, meaning, you know, uh, a distant father, he is Abba Father. And Abba Father is like our term in English, Daddy. Yes, he is God, but he is also our Father. Somebody say, God, he is Father. That's how you know somebody has a relationship, sister, single sisters. You know, somebody having a relationship with the Lord. You know, when they say, you know, they just say, you know, I praise God. I praise God. Or the man upstairs, you know, you, no, he's not even close to being ready for you if you say. Because the truth about the matter, if he truly has a relationship, he's going to say the Lord or he's going to say Father. Those are the terms that clues you in that there is a relationship. And if he hadn't received that kind of love and experienced that kind of love, he can't possibly know how to love you. Because this love that I'm talking about, it's not earthly, it's spiritual. Somebody say it's spiritual. 
We got to know that the Father loves us. 1 John, the third chapter, verse number 1 in the New Living Translation says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. The truth about the matter is that we must develop an unwavering trust in the Father's love. And I think we have to get to a place to where we understand that God is not mad at us. How many understand what I'm talking about? See, see, when you see him as God, you might think, oh, man, he's sitting up there ready to strike me down for every. No, no, no. He's a father. And when you understand a, a good father, they're not there to strike you down every time you do something wrong. There's this correcting, there's chastening, but it all comes from love. It all comes from love. And God is that type of father. If our earthly fathers know how to give us good gifts and be good to us, how much more the heavenly father? So we have to understand that he's not mad at us. He does not want to hurt you. He does not want to um, judge you. What he wants is he wants to just love you. He's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. Tell your neighbor he loves you. So the ability to love and trust God, I understand that it does not come automatically. It comes progressively. It comes progressively. Over time, we discern how much God loves us, and it causes us to love him more. First, we hear of God's love. We hear of the love of God. You know how you heard your grandmother or your mother tell you about the love of God, and then at some point, you experience the love of God for yourself. And when you experience the love of God for yourself and you realize how dirty you were and how trifling you were and God still loved you, you know the scripture says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And how that God was still good to you even though you were not good to him and not good to yourself and doing things wrong. And you discover at some point you experienced his love. You had to experience his love in order to say, what must I do to be saved? You know, it, it brought you to a place to where you decided that you wanted to surrender to him and to serve him. So we understand that it is progressive. So we hear of his love, then we experience his love, and then at that point we know his love. At that point, we can begin to testify of his love. When you're just hearing of it, you can't testify it. You can't testify until you experience it. And how many has experienced the love of God in a powerful way in your lives? I know I've experienced the love of God. In fact, the reason why I preached that first message on the love of God is because it was my experience. I was a brand new Christian, didn't grow up in church, but then God showed me his love. He put a servant in my place, in my way, and he showed me what the love of God is. I told you all the story, the testimony of the gentleman that um, pulled me in and discipled me. And he showed me the love of God. And I didn't know, knew, I didn't know, knew I didn't knew, no, no. I did know. I got degrees, but they didn't help me. I didn't know that love for myself. I didn't know what kind of love that was. I, I was like, what kind of, I mean, I was waiting on him to tell me the real reason he was doing such wonderful things for me how he was going in his pocket and giving me money and taking his floor model tv out of his house and putting it in my house and giving me his car to drive I said what kind of love is this because I'm from the hood y'all and if somebody do something for you they have an expectation of a quick return
But I discovered the love of God. I remember telling him, Minister Milton, I remember telling him, I said, man, that love that you have, I've never experienced that before. I said, I want that love. And it was the love of God. And that love has carried me a long way. Somebody say the father's love. If we don't experience and come to know his love, then we continue to try to gain acceptance through our works. You know, we always trying to get God to accept us, to approve, you know, but we got to understand that when you were adopted into the family of God, you were accepted at the same time. See, see, a lot of people think, okay, like God is mad at them. They're trying to get God's acceptance, you know, but they don't understand that God loves them. He adopted them into his family and he accepted them in the beloved. You're already accepted. So you will stop trying to gain his acceptance through your works because listen here, listen here. There's nothing that you can do to cause God to love you any less. Now, he may not be pleased with all that you do, but you're already accepted. And so it, it now now causes you to want to please him in your actions. But you understand that you're not trying to get God to love you. He already loved you. You're not trying to get him to accept you. He already accepts you. You're just trying to now please him because when you love somebody, you seek to please them. And so when you understand how much he loves you, you receive his love. And now you want to reciprocate by demonstrating how much you love him through your actions by pleasing him. Does that make sense? You know, it's a difference from when we started out in church. You know, when we started out in church, everything was fear based. You don't want to go to hell. Get right. Come in here. You don't want to go to hell. Right. And so we were always afraid, living in fear that we were going to go to hell. And so all of our our, our lives were work based, works based, works based, works based because we were trying to make it in. Ninety nine and a half just won't do. And so, you know, I was thinking, who said you were ever at ninety nine and a half? When would you have ever done enough? For you to be accepted. When would you have ever done enough for you to be approved? When would you have ever done enough for you to warrant heaven? And that's why Jesus came to die. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The scripture says in Ephesians that we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any should boast. So it's, 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 it's about love. It's not about these works. Let me. Let me make it plainer, make it plainer, not quite plain just yet, but let me make it plainer. How many know that God demonstrated his love and that while you were yet sinner, he died for you? So while you were yet a sinner, he died for you. He didn't wait on you to stop sinning, to decide that he was going to come and die for you. But right in the midst of your sin and whoever was sinning in that time when he came, he didn't he knew you would never stop. So while you were yet a sinner, he died for you. What am I saying? If we did nothing to deserve his love. Then there is nothing we can do to cause him to stop loving us. Is that clear? If you did nothing to deserve his love, then there's nothing you can do to cause him to stop. Now, the old church don't like this kind of message because it is fear based. But in the kingdom, it is love based. Right. So we got to get a revelation. There's a revelation of a difference. Now, you must understand that his love, it is trustworthy. Somebody say his love love. is trustworthy. You know, a a navigator or a pilot, 
what he does is he relies on his instrument panel. It could be dark, it could be stormy. And what he does is he relies on the instrument panel to navigate him through the storm. Wherever he's going, he can't see where he's going, so he has to rely on the panel, the instrument panel, to tell him at what feet he is, what what level he is, how he needs to uh, turn or go down or go up or whatever he needs to do. He's relying on the navigational panels. Well, we have to rely and rest confidently in the Father's love and trust him to navigate us through the storms of life. See, the reason why we are so afraid is because we're not trusting in the Father's love. You got all kind of things going on in your life. And the reason why there is so much fear in our lives is because we're not trusting in the Father's love. When you trust in the Father's love, you may not know how everything is going to work out. But you trust that God knows and that you're operating in his providential will. And so he is going to work it out even if you can't see how it's going to be worked out. So you know that you are his. And you know that he takes care of his own. So you rest confidently in the father's love, trusting that whatever I need, he's going to provide. And whatever way that needs to be made, he's going to make it. And whatever needs to be done, he's going to make sure it's done for me. Why? Because he is God and I know that he takes care of me. I'm his child. Somebody say the father's love. So you have to rest confidently in the father's love. Trusting in his love. Because what fear has is fear have torment. The Bible says in 1 John, I believe 1 John, it says that perfect love, it casts out fear. So wherever love is, fear is not. If we're afraid, you know that God, he doesn't give us the spirit of fear. We know that, right? But he gives us the spirit of love and power and of a sound mind. So wherever fear is, then there is an absence or there is less of love. There is less of power. There is less of a sound mind. So we have to learn to allow God's love to be perfected in us. And then we'll find that fear begins to subside in our lives. What do you have in your life going on and what are you afraid of? I guarantee you that it's a love problem. Because when you know his character, not just his ability, but you know his character, you know he won't fail you. Somebody say, abide in the Father's love. We must know and believe the love that God has towards us. We need to know that God loves us just as much as he loves Jesus. How many know that we are his body? That God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Now, to me, this was exciting when I first learned and I for maybe for somebody, this is exciting. I hope it's exciting for you that God loves you perfectly. He loves you as much as he loves Jesus. We're his body. In fact, the scripture says that we are as Jesus is in the world. So when he looks on your life, he sees you as the body of Christ. He loves you. As much as he loved Jesus. So he's in your heart. Tell your neighbor he's in your heart. 
And what, what that means is that you become an extension of heaven on the earth. What it also means is that, that when you receive Jesus in your heart, you receive God's love package also in your heart as well. Now, that love has to be perfected. But the whole purpose of it is that there will be an inflow of love in your life that will produce an outflow of love to others. The whole purpose of the Father pouring out his love on you in your life is so that love will be manifest from breast to breast and from heart to heart. This is still a kingdom message. People like things, like flashy things in the church. And we praise God even for for the offering service. That's what I call it because that's what it is. It's an offering service. And Pastor D, she has an anointing to to share and encourage and exhort on giving and money. And and people are really, really excited about that time because it's I'm getting ready to get my new car. I'm getting ready to get my new house. I'm getting ready to. But then the thing about it is we got to understand that this thing, when we talk about love, it's not flashy like that. It's not a thing that, that's going to bring something to us. It's something that God requires us to give. And truly, that is really what God wants us to understand, that it's not all about you in the kingdom of God. It's not about you getting your stuff. It's not, it's not just about, yeah, God wants you blessed. He wants you prosperous. Yeah, all that stuff she said, I agree with it wholeheartedly. But God wants you to be an ambassador for the kingdom of God. He wants the love that he gives to flow through you. In fact, the Bible says this, it says that if a man say that he loves God and doesn't love his brother, that the man is a liar. He says, how can you say you love God whom you've not seen and not love your brother whom you see every day? God is telling us that it's about horizontal and vertical relationships. If you want to know what your relationship with God is, you want to look at your relationship with the people in your lives. A lot of people think, oh, my relationship with God is tight, but your relationship with people is all broken down. Is not true. Your love for God is directly reflected in your love in the relationships in your life. Somebody say it's a mirror. So what God is trying to do is he's trying to get his people who are his ambassadors in the earth to manifest this invisible kingdom of God in the visible earth. And it's manifested through our love is the primary way. In fact, love is the trademark of a Christian life. Love is the hallmark of Christian character. Love is the way. Love is the way. Tell your neighbor, love is the way. Boy, y'all ain't talking to me today. You know, we're kingdom-minded people. So we want to major in this thing called love because that's what people are looking for. You know, when they come to a house of God, they're looking to see, am I being judged or am I being loved? There is so much judgment out in the world. There is so many things happening in this world. It's a doggy dog world. But are we experiencing the love of God in the place where the love of God is supposed to be most? Somebody say, love somebody, love somebody, love somebody. We need to love somebody. Tell your neighbor, it's going to be the deepest thing you will ever do. There's different types of love. Y'all got to forgive me. I've been gone a while, so it's going to take me a little minute, but not too long. There are different types of love. It's eros love, which is an erotic kind of love. It's a feeling love. Then you have storge, 
which is a familiar love, family type love, brothers and sisters. Then you have phileo, which is a friendship type of love. And then you have agape, which is the father's love, and this love is unconditional love. This is the love that you receive when you receive Jesus Christ. And we're to give this love through our experiential, experiential discovery with God. That we come to know it and then we give it because you can't give what you don't have. And so God requires this of his people. Now, how do you know if the love of God is being perfected in you? How do you know if this love that God gives to us is being perfected? Because the, the more that is perfected, the more the people in your life will be blessed. The more people will be reached with the gospel. Because how many know your life speaks? But how do you know if the love of God is being perfected in your life? Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that love has a character. Love has a character. Love will be more patient. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Let's put it in the New Living Translation. It says, if I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noising gong or a clanking cymbal. And if I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be, somebody say nothing. Verse 3, and if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained. That's why this is important. Love is, this is the character, this is how you know it's being perfected in you. And I am one that I want the, the character of God to be perfected in me. Love is patient. And what it is? Love is not. I wouldn't want to just come to church and then be impatient and nasty. Jealous and boastful or proud. Verse number four. Or what? This is the kind of stuff we need to talk about in church. Because we name the name of Jesus, but we out there being rude in the community. I'm not saying that somebody did something to you, you're not supposed to get angry or not have an attitude because sometimes, but, but, but you got to understand that you represent Christ. And so if love is being perfected in you, at some point your attitude is going to change and you used to be rude, but now I'm less rude because the love of God is being perfected in my life. It's not selfish because it does not demand its own way. I'm talking about abiding in the Father's love. It's not irritable. How irritable are we? I'm preaching to myself. And it, it, it's no, it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Like some people, are, uh, uh, some people are rejoice over the wrong things. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It always is hopeful and it endures through every circumstance. That's how you know the love of God is being perfected in you when these things start to show up in your character and in your life. And there ought to be some way that you can track the progression. Am I talking right? Tell your neighbor, I want to do better. 
let me let me share these things and I, I'm going to be done. If y'all can y'all give me more five more minutes. Jesus, he came to reveal God as our loving, caring, sharing, heavenly father. And we see him constantly demonstrating the love of God in scripture. I'll give you two instances. The first instance is when the woman was caught in the act of adultery. And y'all remember her accusers were trying to condemn her. They were ready to stone her. And we find in the text that, you know, the whole story that Jesus, he began to write on the ground. Am I right? Am I telling it right? I'm going by memory. And then he tells them, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And then when he looked up, there was nobody. They dropped them rocks. And Jesus asked, where are thine accusers? They had gone. He knew what she had done. Very well he knew what she had done. He told her what she had done. But he tells her to go and sin no more. He forgave her and told her to go and sin no more. The religious folks wanted to stone her. But he's trying to show us the father's love. How that you can hate the sin, but love the sinner. And that's what God requires of us. There's another guy. I'll give you the second one. His name is Peter. And y'all start laughing because y'all know I love to talk about Peter. And Jesus, we find him dealing with Peter on several occasions. Because Peter wasn't abiding in the Father's love. He was in and out of the love of God. Jesus was trying to teach him, but he was like a lot of us. We're hard-headed and stubborn and set in our ways and think we know better. But Jesus is teaching Peter through these illustrated sermons. And we see Peter in many different places. Y'all remember Peter was the first one that said, Thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. Boy, he was connected to the father in that revelation. But then in another place, Jesus was talking about his impending death. And Peter, Peter was like, no, no, no. No. -uh. And Jesus had to rebuke the devil in Peter. He was letting the devil use him. So in one moment, Peter was getting it all the way right. In another moment, he was getting it all the way wrong. One moment, he's thinking about his place. So he's like, no, you can't go nowhere because I got a place next to you. So I'm thinking about myself. And so he's in the love of God, out of the love of God. Well, y'all hadn't heard it yet, right? Those are, well, he's in the love of God. He revealed, God reveals himself to him. We find that Peter, after that, you know, he's the one. That left the boat to walk on the water. St. Peter. <laughs> Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come. He said, come. Peter steps out. Boldness. Went from boldness to fear. In and out of the God. Up and down. Somebody said up and down. You know, when they were coming... To arrest Jesus. You know Peter. Pulled out a sword. And attacked. The servant of the high priest. John 18. And was immediately told. To put that weapon away Peter. Jesus had to tell him. Man I ain't come here for that. You know don't you know. I can call legions. 
Like he's in and out. He's discerning one moment, not discerning another moment. Up and down like a lot of us. Somebody say in and out of the love of God. Peter said, you know, I'll never deny you. But we know he's the one that denied Jesus three times. And when they confronted Peter about denying Jesus, Peter started cussing. Somebody say, in and out of the love of God. Start cussing. Now, you ain't, you ain't loving right here. You cussing now. But then Jesus told Peter, he said, Peter, I pray for you that your faith fail you not. The enemy desires to sift you as wheat, but I pray for you. In other words, I see you greater than where you are right now. I see what the enemy is trying to do to your life. I see you are unstable, but I love you, Peter, and I see purpose on your life, and I see you being an asset to me, but you're going to go through this thing until you learn to love God, to abide in his love. By the time we get to Acts, the second chapter, Peter has figured it out. On the day of Pentecost, the Bible says they were sitting in the upper room and they all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And Peter stood up in the moment, this unstable guy, always in and out of the love of God, stands up in the middle and said, these are not drunk as ye suppose. But this is that that the prophet Joel spoke of, that in the last days I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters. They shall. So Peter, he's getting it right. He's finally figured out. Peter, at one point, Peter said, I'm not even worthy to die like the Lord. Because he finally figured it out. I'm reminded. If I digress a little bit, just for this point. That Peter, we know he was in and out of the love of God. Because Jesus, he came to Peter one time. And he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Like you love me. But you know his love was in question. Because Jesus asked him three times. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. He asked you, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than this livelihood, these fish? Or whatever he was referring to, it was like, do you love me more than these? That's the question. And then it went further on. That Jesus began to explain, you know, some thing. He told Peter, he said, the manner by which he would die. Y'all remember it's in John, the 21st. And Peter saw John, the Bible says, whom Jesus loved. And he asked Jesus, well, what's going to happen to him? How is he going to die? Jesus said, listen, if... He lived until I came back, my return. He said, what is it to you? In other words, he was saying, Peter, don't worry about nobody else, Peter. I need you to get your love right. I'll do whatever I'm going to do. But Peter, I need you to get your love right. I need you to feed my sheep. I need you to feed my lambs. And we find Peter on the day of Pentecost feeding the Lamb of God. We find Peter standing up, finally figuring it out. But Jesus was trying to tell him, listen, Peter, there's great things in your life, but you're going to have to learn to get stable. You're going to have to learn to get stable. And you're going to have to learn to trust in the Father's love. And when you learn to trust in the Father's love, there is nothing that you cannot do that God has called you to. And you'll find that you will be more 
meet for the master's use, fit for the kingdom of God, having your hands to the plow, doing kingdom business like you've never seen before. Is that exciting for somebody? We need to get a revelation of the Father's love. And then we need to abide in that love. Can the church say amen?